Welcome to the Cell Guru Show and I've got for you today a phone that most people have absolutely and totally gone nuts about. This is the Mi 10T Pro. When the Mi 10 came out, most people said, who's going to buy a phone for 50,000 from Xiaomi? And to a great extent, people were correct. I mean, that phone did well, but it did not set the market on fire. But here's a prediction. This one could because this one pretty much tick marks everything on the box and at a price point that is almost impossible to fathom. We've got that, we've got the Qualcomm segment, we've got a lot of news and a whole lot more. Let's get started with today's Cell Guru. <music> Xiaomi Mi 10T Pro. When the rumors started, people said that the price point, if they have that, it will be 50,000, 45,000. Even though it's a great phone, it will not do very, very well. When the phone came out and the rumors actually became reality and we saw that features, specs, looks, camera, screen, uh, inside processor, everything was absolutely fantastic. So at that time people said, what's the price point going to be? And the price point totally shocked everybody. This is an incredible phone at an incredible price. Lekin, the things that we have to look into which is very, very important is not just the specs. Mi phones are notorious for very, very poor software. The UI, the bloatware, the amount of things they add on to the phone, all of that really, really matters. So we'll do both things. We'll look at the phone. We'll tell you if this is the best phone at this price point. We'll take a look at the software too. Xiaomi's expansion into the premium segment in India was long awaited and it finally happened with the Mi 10 earlier this year. The phone brought the specs, stellar design and a flagship camera setup, all for a price that placed it right against competitor OnePlus. Now Xiaomi is back with yet another flagship killer, but this time around the company is being even more aggressive with the price. Does the Mi 10T Pro live up to the promise of the original? Can it still beat the competition? Or have compromises been made? Let's find out in our Mi 10T Pro review. Take a quick look at the Mi 10T Pro and it is quick to see the continuity in design. The phone has a glass and aluminium build with Gorilla Glass 5 both at the back and front. While the phone feels very premium to the touch, clocking in at 218 grams, the Mi 10T Pro feels just a bit too heavy and unwieldy in the hand. The large dimensions mean that one hand use is almost out of the question. The Mi 10T opts for a side-mounted fingerprint scanner which is a much welcome addition for its speed and reliability. Finally, the camera bump protrudes a bit too much from the phone and we found it catching onto our pocket while we were sliding it in. Over at the front, there is a 6.67 inch Full HD plus 144Hz IPS panel. First, the good. This is one of the highest refresh rate panels that you can get on a phone right now and it truly makes navigation through the interface buttery smooth. On the flip side, support for games is minimal at launch and you won't be making much use of that high refresh rate screen. Additionally, compared to the older Mi 10, the switch from AMOLED to IPS LCD means that the black levels won't be as good. However, the screen goes more than bright enough outdoors and offers excellent color accuracy. Talking about the cameras, the Mi 10T Pro has three of them at the back. This includes an excellent 108 MP primary sensor that shoots stunning images in broad daylight. The camera manages to nail the exposure, color saturation and details to create visually appealing natural looking shots. Things however go south in less than ideal light. The night mode helps but there is still too much noise. The 13MP ultra-wide camera takes satisfactory shots with a decent amount of detail and finally there is a 5MP macro shooter when you want to get up close with your subject. Meanwhile, the 20MP front-facing camera is capable of taking decent shots as long as the lighting is good. The portrait mode however is not that great at edge detection and low light images suffer. Coming to the performance, the phone is powered by a Snapdragon 865 chipset that makes sure everything flies when paired with the 8GB of RAM. The phone runs on MIUI 12 based on Android 10 and is polished to a sheen. Whether you like the design choices or not is up to your personal preference, but there are lots of useful features here and Xiaomi has done an excellent job at optimizing the software. And yes, there are no ads. 
Keeping things going all day long is a 5000 mAh battery that we found to be more than sufficient for a full day of use. In fact, with light usage, the phone might even last you two days. 33 watt charging support means that it won't take you too long to top up the phone, but there is no support for wireless charging. Overall, priced at 39,999 rupees, the Mi 10T Pro makes a few compromises to achieve its price point. It is still excellent value for money for the hardware, but the hit or miss low light camera and lack of premium features like wireless charging mean that the Pro is not a huge step up over the regular Mi 10T. And if performance is a big criteria, the regular Mi 10T might be the better value option for you since it brings most of the same hardware at a lower price. And now let's move on to our Qualcomm segment for the experiences you deserve where we take a look at all the great stuff that's inside your phone but you never think about. You know, it's been a while since any of us had to go to a store to pick up a copy of the latest movie. Remember going to a PC or a booth to make a phone call? Or if you want a real throwback, how many of you remember writing handwritten letters or notes? A time when the only emojis were hand-drawn smileys and hearts. Or sending your camera roll for developing so that you could actually see the pictures you've taken. Fast forward to today, the smartphone is not just a part of our life, they could well be an extension of our arms. From doing basically everything we do with one touch to often doing those anyway without even needing any input at all. It's a very different world where we are served a beautiful plate of food. We first take a photo of it instead of digging into that food. I mean, how many of us do it, right? We add 20 emojis at the end of our LOLs and record multiple videos of that puppy. We see just because that puppy is just so cute. But have you ever really given it some serious thought? How this thin slab of glass and metal in your hand actually pulls off so much magic. It's of course the processor inside the smartphone that does it all. But what is this processor we keep talking about? I mean, what does it really look like? It's there deep inside your phone. What does it contain? How is it actually built? Just how small is this marvel of engineering? Actually, you may have heard that good things come in small packages. Well, that package is really small and really thin. You see, a smartphone processor is made of billions of transistors and each of these transistors is a mere 7 nm. What's even more fascinating is this tiny piece of silicon houses billions of transistors and is responsible for everything our smartphones actually do. It has components like the CPU, which is the real brain behind our smartphones, the GPU, which is the graphic processor unit, which handles graphics during your gaming sessions and everything else. Now, there's even an image processing unit whose job is to convert numbers and code from the camera into pictures and videos that we all actually love. Now, one company that is leading the charge in processor technology is Qualcomm, which develops the Snapdragon brand of mobile platforms. Did you know that a lot of this development happens right here in our backyard in India? Qualcomm has development centers in Hyderabad and Bangalore and employs more than 10,000 engineers to work on these very high-tech developments. So take a seat and join me on a wonderful journey inside your smartphone. We did something very, very interesting. We went out on the streets and spoke with all of you to find out how well versed you are with your smartphone. Key components are battery, screen, fingerprint sensor. Then there will be a motherboard. The fingerprint touches there. Camera, the processor. The display, there's a battery, there's a camera. I'm sure billions. <laughs> millions. 50 lakhs. Billion lines only. It will be millions of, more than like a 10 million lines of code, I think. Close to two years or something. Around six to eight months. Six months. Maybe six months or six months. So I'm guessing it takes less than a year for them.
Today we have a different format. We have two people joining us. First, Shashi Reddy, Vice President, Engineering, Qualcomm India Private Limited, who manages Qualcomm's Hyderabad Center, and Srini Madali, Vice President, Engineering, Qualcomm India Private Limited, who manages Qualcomm's Bangalore Center. Fascinating, right? Let's hear from them about the overall journey of making a processor. Now, gentlemen, a couple of weeks ago, we learned that it takes about two years from the day you start planning a processor to the day handsets with that processor become available in the hands of consumers. Can you explain overall the process and why it takes so long and what all is involved in making of a processor? Great question, Raji. First of all, let me tell you that processor is a very constrained terminology in the context of Snapdragon platforms. What we deliver is a complete mobile platform. It's a system level solution that can meet the evolving needs of today's cell phone user. Today's cell phone is a lot more than a communication device. It's a convergence of multiple consumer devices. Mobile platform is a hardware software environment developed for smartphones, laptops, tablets, and other portable devices. The platform solution comprises of hardware parts such as CPU, GPU, NPU, signal processors, modem engine, AI engine, it also has wireless transceivers, RF parts, audio codecs, Wi-Fi connectivity, and quick charge. There is also the associated software components which go along with it. These are like communication system software for 4G, 5G, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, wireless protocols, multimedia software for camera, audio, video, graphics, for gaming, along with the OS support software for Android and Windows, security software, AI engines for implementing on-device AI. All these components are packaged into a Snapdragon platform. Shashi talked about a very important point, the Snapdragon platform. I would like to add a bit more color to it. The Snapdragon platform is a very important in many ways for us, our customers and consumers. From Qualcomm point of view, we design hardware engines in Snapdragon chips to enable flexibility. The platform approach helps to meet our customer requirements and ability to scale and enhance the user experience without compromising their seamless capabilities expected by the phone users. For our customers, the handset developers, it provides great flexibility to differentiate the phone. They do so by choosing different hardware parts such as a display, camera, sensors to differentiate a phone model from the other models. The phone manufacturers leverage the hardware in Snapdragon chip to create superior user experience that consumers enjoy. As an example, camera or video quality in different light conditions or different scenarios, graphic capability to create realistic gaming experiences. So, the Snapdragon platform gives a huge advantage to our customers and added benefit to consumers. You know, this is so, so interesting. I could sit for hours and talk about all this. Okay, so what are the key stages and steps in this development? As you mentioned, Rajiv, the process starts two plus years before you see the devices in the market. It starts with a blueprint of uh, features required in the Snapdragon chipset to meet the future requirements of the consumers. Once we finalize the features, significant effort is involved to ensure the hardware engines are architected, designed and customized to meet high quality and performance requirements at a very low power. While the hardware engines are being developed, we build system level validation platforms to confirm the interoperability of the hardware engines. All hardware engines validated at the system level with software to ensure end-to-end -end platform requirements are met before enabling our customers deploy commercial. Just adding on what Srini outlined, the entire planning process of hardware and software development go hand in hand. It involves a detailed evaluation of various technologies to fit consumer experience, followed by a complex cycle of design, development, integration and test. We also create reference designs that act as blueprints for our OEM partners. In the end, we work closely with the OEM partners to help them utilize these platforms meaningfully and successfully launch their products. Now you have a big setup in India. Can you tell us what all you do in India 
for India. A majority of the Snapdragon platforms develop out of our India design centers. Being in India, it helps us to connect and understand the local consumer requirements, features required, interests and network conditions. We use this knowledge to enable and support these features. Qualcomm is closely involved with mobile's ecosystem in India and as part of it, Qualcomm is the first to incorporate and enable navigation with Indian constellation Navic on multiple Snapdragon platforms. We worked with UIDAI to create an early proof of concept for secure biometrics. Recently, we worked with the local ecosystem to develop first 4G feature phones for India. In addition to developing and enabling these features, our India teams work with operators to make sure that the modem on the devices and the networks are tuned properly. Be it the normal data communication, be it the voice call or Wi-Fi experience, we optimize it all. Further, while working with our OEM partners, we help them understand how to leverage the previous work and tune the device for performance and battery, even the thermal experience on the handset due to different climatic conditions in India needs to be optimized. A lot of the team OEM support and optimizations and working with the operators happens out of our India development centers. Thank you so much, both of you. Wonderful having you on the show. Let's take a quick break right now on the show and we come back lots more. And now let's move on to our last story of this show, Google Nest coming up. A very interesting new product by Google. Choosing a new smart speaker for your home? There's a new entrant in the market. Google has launched its latest Nest audio smart speaker and it looks to take on the likes of Amazon's Echo and Apple's HomePod Mini. This new smart speaker promises great audio quality and of course the pure Google experience. The Nest Audio is built like a cylinder with a unidirectional speaker. It has a soft feel to it and is covered with a plastic mesh fabric. There are four LED indicators on the front that show volume level. While the design may not be the best, the audio output is very promising. The Nest Audio has great sound quality and can be heard from across the room with ease. The speaker comes equipped with a fully functional Google Assistant, which means that it responds to any and every question you can ask. For setting up the Nest Audio, you will need the Google Home app. The app is easy to navigate and after connecting to the Wi-Fi, it does everything on its own. There isn't a lot to complain about with the Nest Audio. With great sound output and an affordable price of 7,000 rupees, this smart speaker won't disappoint you and it is a great addition to your living room. I have to tell you a small little behind the scenes secret. Our cupboards in the Cell Guru lab are absolutely full. We are in fact storing things outside. We've got so much stuff. So new iPhones coming up, new phones coming up from various other brands and our Diwali special all happening next week. See you then.